right, in this video we're going to talk about uh, force versus position graphs. And remember that sometimes the variable y, z, r, or even s can be used to talk about an object's position or distance traveled. Um, r is the variable that actually ends up on your AP equation sheet. So when we draw a graph of force versus position or displacement, really change of position, let's use r since later we'll find r on our uh, AP equation sheet. All right, so this graph is just going to be easy. Let's just take some random function f, and we'll graph it. Maybe the force is 10 newtons, maybe it's 20, it doesn't really matter. It's constant, so it's a flat line. And I'm going to mark off a certain area of this graph with two positions, r0 and r. If you remember from our conversation about areas of graphs, you can find meaning in the area if you take the height, which would be f, and multiplying that by the width, which in this case would be delta r. So force times the change of position, the displacement, is work. So now you've discovered that the work of a force versus position graph tells you, I'm sorry, the area of a force versus position graph tells you the work that's being done on an, on an object. This is useful if the force that you're looking at, like if this force right here, is the only force acting on the object, because that would be giving you an amount of network. And if you know what the network is, then you can quantify the change of kinetic energy in an object and therefore say how fast it's going at certain times. Let's do an example. Here you have a 2 kilogram box pushed with a varying force as shown in the graph below. If the velocity of the box is 1 meter per second at 0 meters, what's the velocity of the box at 7 meters? Okay, so here in the beginning, you have an initial velocity of uh, sorry 1 meter per second. So your kinetic energy at that point is half of the mass, 2 kilograms, times the velocity squared, 1 meter per second squared. So half of 2 is 1 times 1 squared. It's still 1. This is 1 joule of kinetic energy. At the end, there's going to be some velocity that you want to find. And the way that you're going to find it is by first getting the kinetic energy at this position of 7 meters. So here's how we do that. We take a look at the area between our function and the x-axis. Uh, and I'm going to break this into little pieces. So here I have a triangle that looks like it is you know, splitting this 2 by 2 block in half, which tells me that the area of this is 2, and it represents 2 joules, or 2 newton meter times meters. This little chunk right here is going to be a width of 1 times a height of 2, uh, you know, 2 newtons times 1 meter. So again, this will also give me a positive 2 joules of work done. And then here I have an area that looks like it takes up half of 2 boxes, which would give me 2 joules. And since this is below the x-axis, we would actually say that this is a negative, oh, I'm sorry, not 2 joules, no, 1 joule because it's half of those two boxes. So we make this a negative 1 joule. Uh, the area tells us that there's some negative work being done there. All right, so all of these works added together will give us a network of 4 minus 1 or 3 joules. So from the area of the graph, I found the network 3 joules. I can now use my network equation um, where it's equal to a change of kinetic energy and think about the kinetic energy in the beginning versus the kinetic energy at the end. I want to find the kinetic energy at the end, so I would take the network and add the initial kinetic energy to it, which of course is 3 joules plus that 1 uh, joule that we found of kinetic energy earlier. I don't know why I can't write the J. Hold on. There we go. Okay, so 4 joules of kinetic energy. Now when I want to find the velocity, remember the kinetic energy is equal to half the mass times velocity squared. So solving for V, I'm going to get the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy over the mass. Or 2 times, this is going to be 4 joules, which I'm actually going to write this not as a joule, but as a newton times a meter. And then you divide that by 2 kilograms. Uh, let's talk about the units real quick. The newton times a meter is really like saying a kilogram times a meter per second squared units of newtons times meters, uh, newton meter. But that's kind of annoying, so instead of writing meters per second squared times meters, I'm going to write meters squared per second squared. 
All right, now the kilograms cancel out. When I take the square root of meter squared over second squared, I'm going to get meters per second, which is what I want. Uh, the twos cancel out. You get the square root of four. So two meters per second is your velocity. Let's do another one. Oh, sorry. We'll do another one in a second. Uh, work is an integral. So since you now recognize that the area of a force versus displacement graph is the work done on an object, that's really meaningful to us because we know how to find the areas of varying functions. So like, let's say, for example, you had some variable force and when you graphed it, it looked like that. Well, if I wanted to find the area underneath this function from some position r0 to r, it's really easy for me to do that because I can find the work, the area, by infinitely adding, that's what summa means, the area of a number of lines. So if you forget this, this is kind of goofy. Basically we say, all right, here is a line. The area of that line is f, the height, times the distance, and or the width. And the width is an infinitely small change in position. So we would say dr. Um, and when we summa, when we infinitely add all of those things up from r0 to r, basically it's like we're like a printer adding up all these little lines of area and getting an actual amount of work. Um, so the area of this graph from calculus is giving you an actual useful integrating equation, or you'd use the antiderivative to find this. And believe it or not, this is how the AP test chooses to show you the equation for work. They will not say force times distance or FD cosine theta. They will give you this integral to tell you what work is. Let's do an example with it. You push a two kilogram box with a varying force on a frictionless table. Calculate the work done on the box from x equals two meters to x equals five meters. Then find the velocity at x equals five meters if the velocity at x equals two meters is two meters per second. All right, so here, for part one, I'm going to find the work, which means I need to integrate some force with respect to a position variable. It looks like the variable chosen here is x. So instead of writing dr, I'm going to write dx. Again, you get to choose which one is most relevant to your problem. Since the position is x in this, I'll use x for my integral. All right, that means I need to write this f equation in a math friendly or calculus friendly way which pretty much just means I neuter the units um, instead of one newton per meter squared times x squared I'm gonna write one x squared or just x squared and instead of writing two newtons I'll write minus two so that's my function in kind of a math friendly uh, language if you will and when I want to integrate it I'm going to put that inside of my integral. Okay, so now I know to find the work, I need to take x squared minus 2 and integrate it, or anti-derive it. The other thing that I need to write, or you know, tell the AP test grader that I'm doing, is that I only want to find the work from 2 to 5 meters. So I would start with 2 on the bottom and 5 on the top. And actually, since we're not putting units in this, we can take them away. So this is kind of a simple antiderivative, which you might want to pause the video and see if you can remember how to do an antiderivative. Uh, but basically, the squared is going to turn into a cube, and you're going to divide the one, that's, you know, the invisible one in front of the x, by 3. You need to evaluate this number from 2 to 5. And then for the negative 2, it's actually just going to become negative 2x, and you'll evaluate that from 2 to 5. All right, so this is kind of like, you know, some, some mucky algebra. It'll take you a little bit to do, but if I was going to start with the first term, I would do 1 third times 5 cubed minus 1 third times 2 cubed. That's my first term. That's evaluating the 1 third x cubed. And then for the second term, I would do uh, negative 
2 times 5 minus 2 times 2. You can check your math um, or use your graphing calculator if you remember how to do that, which is you would go to y equals, and for this you would put in x squared minus 2. You'd graph it. Second, calc, go down to 7. And then you would put in your limits, which in this case we said 2 and 5. And we're going to get 33. So again, you can do that algebraically, or you can always use your calculator on the AP test if they give it to you numerically. Sometimes they do. Uh, and so now I know the work done is 33 joules. So here's the thing, though. As long as the only force acting on the object is this variable force, I can say that this is the net work. And I want to know what the net work is so that I can say for part 2, also this is the answer for part 1, so we should say that. I want to know what the net work is so that for part 2, I can figure out what is the velocity at x equals 5 meters. So basically, here, we want to find v. And this 2 meters per second we'll call our v naught because it's our initial velocity. And I know the net work equals the change in k. And the velocity that I want is inside of my final kinetic energy. So just like last time, I would effectively find that kinetic energy in the beginning by doing half of, that's a terrible knot, uh, half of 2 kilograms times 2 meters per second, the whole thing squared, which is half of 2, or 1 times 4, so 4 joules of energy. And now I go back to my other equation. The final kinetic energy is going to be the network plus that initial kinetic energy, or 33 plus 4, 37 joules. Now I can use that to find the velocity. 2 times the kinetic energy, just borrowing the equation that we used previously over 2 kilograms. Uh, the 2's cancel out. It doesn't always work out like that, but it has in the numbers that I've given you. Uh, and this is going to give you 6.1 meters per second. Okay, so that's how we used calculus to find the work done by a force instead of um, actually multiplying two numbers together. We're, we're using the area of a graph to kind of find it for ourselves. All right, and we're going to do another one real quick. Probably the easiest type of problem, or one of the easiest types of problems for you to use integration instead of like drawing a free body diagram is anything with a spring. So here we have a problem with a spring. An elite dart is inside of a spring-loaded Nerf gun. A force of two newtons holds a small spring pulled back 0.1 meters inside of the barrel. We're going to calculate the work done by the spring when it fires the dart, and then we use that to find how fast the dart is going before it leaves the spring. Um, now, you can imagine a dart inside of a Nerf gun, but I'm actually going to draw this a very specific way. A compressed spring. So, this is a spring that's been compressed. And then I'm going to put a box in front of that spring. On the AP test, they love to put boxes on frictionless tables. They'd say that this is frictionless. Um, and then they're compressing springs. They're running into the spring. It's like their favorite thing to do. But this is basically like a dart inside of a Nerf gun. Um, and we're ignoring friction. So to calculate the work that's done by this, we're going to think about how this object is going to be experiencing a forward force from the spring, which we'll call Fs. Um, it'll also have some weight and a normal force, but we actually don't need either of those if there's no friction. If there was friction, we would need it. Uh, but so the spring force is doing work on the object, and as the object moves, I'm going to get rid of this, it's going to go from some initial position that it's at. Let's mark this position with zero. And then later it's going to be, you know, flying off of the spring with some velocity. And at that point, the spring is no longer going to be in contact with the box. So there would be no spring force. It'd be kind of zero. It would just be moving with that velocity. And this position, we'll say, is 0.1. Okay, well, if I want to find the work that's done by that force, I need to integrate the force of the spring with respect to, um, we're used, let's use x to talk about these positions. So 
to say DX. Okay, real quick note. When you use the spring force equation, also known as Hooke's Law, it is negative K delta X, where the negative comes from the fact that the displacement of the spring, um, remember this is what's known as the distance or displacement from equilibrium, it's always in the opposite direction of the spring force. Uh, I could draw it this way, that would be delta X, it goes to the left, it's a terrible arrow. It's always in the opposite direction of the spring, and so their vector, you know, the, the vector quantities or whatever, they're always going to be in opposite directions. For us, we're going to do two things to modify this equation. First of all, instead of saying delta X, I'm just going to decide that X is the distance that the spring has been compressed or stretched, and its rest position is zero. So instead of saying delta X, I'm just going to say X. Now the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to think about the magnitudes, or simply the number part of each of these. So I'm going to relate the force of the spring to Kx, not negative K delta X. Then when I want to decide if something is positive or negative, I will look at my free body diagram and see if that force is in the direction of the acceleration or not. If it is, I'll make it positive. If it's not, I'll make it negative. In this case, the box is speeding up to the right, so that spring force would be a positive spring force. And when I put it inside of my equation to integrate, I will just write kx dx. Now, here's what's easy about this problem. To find k, I just need to divide the spring force by the initial amount that it is stretched, which is 0.1. So 2 newtons would be the amount of force in the spring over 0.1 meters gives me 20 newtons per meter. Okay, so that's the first thing. I need to know k. And now if I want to, I can rewrite this in a math-friendly way. I can write 20x dx. Then I want to think about what I want to integrate from to. Let's start at 0 and integrate to 0.1, because that's the distance over which the spring does work. So 0 to 0 0.1 meters. Or again, we're getting rid of units, so we don't need it. We'll just leave it 0.1. Okay, well, when I integrate this, there's an x in my equation, so this would become x squared. I would do half of 20, which is 10, and then I would need to evaluate that from 0 to 0.1. When I do this, I'm going to get 10 times 0.1 squared minus 0, and that gives me point, oops, sorry, point 0.1 joules of energy. So the work done by that spring force is 0.1 joules of energy. Okay, now, that's the first of all, that's the answer to part one. Now to find the answer for part two, how fast will the dart be going when it leaves the spring? Well, if that's the only force acting on it, if there's no friction, then that means the net work is 0.1 joules. And, of course, the net work equals the change of the kinetic energy, or K minus K naught. This problem is super easy because the initial kinetic energy is zero since it starts from rest. Therefore, the final kinetic energy is 0.1 joules. And when I want to find the velocity at that point, I'll do the square root of twice that kinetic energy, just like I did before, over the mass of 0 0.001 kilograms. When you put this in your calculator, you should get 14.1 meters per second. Okay, so again, in these problems, the force is varying. It depends on some position x. So we're using integration or the antiderivative to determine the amount of work done on the object with that varying force. Usually we're doing that so that we can figure out a change in an object's motion. Is it gaining kinetic energy? Is it losing it? Uh, and what speed will it be going based on that kinetic energy? You did a great job. I don't know where my cat is. Congratulations. You are done. And look, I know that this video is like basically 20 minutes, and I said it wasn't going to be 20 minutes, but what can I say? I tried really hard to go fast, and it didn't work, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, no video tomorrow. You're just going to do problems. Congratulations. Goodbye.